Feminist for the 99% wants to be a project of liberation for uh, everybody. Uh, and this is uh, what the meaning of for the 99% is. So in other words, it is a feminist project. So we start from, and it's a working class project. So we start from a partial perspective, a particular perspective, but uh, in order to elaborate a project of uh, liberation for the whole of humanity. Yeah, of course, they, we were inspired by the new feminist wave. Uh, and uh, galvanized by the new feminist wave and, uh, and uh, it is uh, witnessing this enormous movement that uh, gave us the courage to actually sit down and write a manifesto, um, which is meant to provide a very accessible thesis, 11 thesis, uh, that explain why capitalism is very bad for women and why what we need is uh, anti-capitalist feminism. So the new feminist movement uh, internationally started in 2017 after the, um, the big uh, women's strikes in Poland and Argentina in the fall of 2016. And uh, in 2017, March 8, uh, was uh, the first uh, transnational women's strike uh, that um, saw the participation of dozens and dozens of, of countries. And of course, uh, uh, in, uh, in different ways and uh, with different uh, impact according to the, to the country. But uh, uh, that was uh, the first important step towards the development of uh, what we are now seeing is an, uh, an ever-expanding uh, feminist wave, which has chosen a strike as, uh, uh, not only as a way of struggle, as a means of struggle, but also as a way of uh, uh, politicization, so as a process of uh, politicization, in particular because uh, the term strike uh, emphasizes uh, women's uh, labor, women's work, both uh, the wage labor, so the labor that women do and uh, that is recognized and paid, at least partially paid, uh, still exploited, and the unpaid, unwaged uh, labor that women do to reproduce life, to reproduce society uh, and human beings, which is not recognized as labor and of course is not uh, paid. Uh, so it was an important step um, to call for a uh, feminist strike because this uh, uh, gave also the opportunity to relink the feminist uh, movement to uh, class struggle, so to the labor movement. The problem is that uh, for uh, decades the predominant feminism uh, has been uh, liberal feminism and uh, Feminism has always had this divide between liberal feminism and you know, working class or class struggle feminism throughout its, uh, its history. Uh, but in the last decades, uh, liberal feminism uh, was uh, the hegemonic force and uh, presented itself as what feminism is about. Uh, and I think this is what caused the problem uh, today in the sense that clearly that kind of feminism is not class uh, uh, struggle feminism and doesn't take into account uh, uh, working class women. But the response to that uh, cannot be reductionist, cannot be to say, ah, let's speak about the worker as, the worker, as if workers uh, didn't have a gender or a race. Uh, the, the real response is to articulate a working class feminism. Just to give an example, um, uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, it is uh, really something that has directly to do with class exploitation, with disciplining uh, uh, the female labor force. Uh, um, sexual harassment is used explicitly as a way to discipline women workers. So then the experience of going to a workplace and being exploited as a worker, but also uh, being subject to sexual harassment uh, uh, and so on, or uh, uh, marginalization because of uh, uh, one's gender, um, it is not divided. We should be aware of the fact that there have always been at least two different tendencies within the history of socialism of uh, the working class movement. Uh, one tendency, which is the reductionist tendency, which is that of uh, seeing class exploitation as uh, um, uh, not linked, intrinsically linked to race and gender, to racialization and, uh, and uh, gender oppression, uh, and then to then uh, create some uh, hierarchies. So, you know, we have the main uh, contradiction, which is labor and against capital, and then we have everything else, but this is secondary. But then there is another tendency in, uh, throughout the whole history of, uh, of uh, socialism and uh, the working class movement, 
uh, that has not um, uh, taken this kind of political approach uh, and that has always seen uh, class exploitation as uh, intrinsically bound with uh, um, uh, gender oppression, colonial uh, oppression, uh, racial oppression and so on. So I think uh, the danger of uh, using this kind of uh, um, uh, narrow understanding of what class exploitation is and what class uh, uh, domination is. The danger is uh, that of, uh, first of all, not uh, uh, speaking to the real experience that uh, working class people have every day. So in other words, uh, if we take, um, start from the assumption that actually the large majority of the working class worldwide is not white, is racialized, um, and that uh, uh, an increasing component of the working class is uh, female uh, and also queer, um, then uh, uh, we cannot really, when we look at their uh, uh, lived experience, how they experience exploitation and what it means to belong to the working class and to, uh, and to have you know, not only exploitation in the workplace but also domination within society, uh, clearly it's not uh, that easy to separate in their experience uh, what counts as gender oppression and what counts as class exploitation. So the composition of the movement clearly uh, varies according to countries, but um, in uh, uh, countries like Argentina or Spain or uh, Italy uh, or Poland, it has taken really mass uh, dimensions with an activation of the of important sectors of the working class. Um, and uh, uh, this is also the idea of the feminists for the 99%. Of course, we should have a centrality of uh, working class women both those who work for a wage and those who work without a wage, um, but uh, at the same time with the ambition of uh, mobilizing the whole of society um, on, uh, uh, you know, around the demands and the claims and the analysis uh, uh, articulated uh, by working class uh, women, in, uh, immigrant women, racialized uh, women. So I think the, the aspiration of uh, both of the movement but also of Feminists for the 99% is to uh, as I said before, to, in a sense, uh, be in a movement that uh, starts from uh, uh, the particular, which means a particular viewpoint uh, on uh, the capitalist reality in which we all live, um, that mobilizes and aims at mobilizing, first of all, working class women, but then also with the capacity of expanding, or uh, with an old term we may call it, you know, hegemony, <laughs> basically. Uh, so mobilizing uh, transversally the whole of society. The movement has already organized three transnational uh, strikes and uh, the dynamic has been expansive. So the last strike was bigger than the previous one. But of course, uh, uh, organizing uh, strikes uh, after strikes cannot be the only way we move forward. So one uh, uh, thing that I think we should discuss within uh, the movement is uh, how to strengthen international coordination. And for example, I know that the Chilean uh, feminist movement is going to organize uh, a continental uh, meeting uh, in November in Chile. And I think we should uh, do something similar also in Europe, for example, to have uh, uh, a transnational meeting of the movement uh, in Europe and in the Mediterranean area, perhaps connected with the moment also of mobilization. And uh, starting from there, uh, um, seeing how we can uh, build forms of uh, more stable transnational coordination uh, uh, within the movement, but also how to share experiences and how to share strategies and have uh, a strategic discussion that is not just at the national level anymore, but it's uh, already uh, at a transnational level. <laughs>